Hi everyone, welcome back to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm joined by my guest today, Natalia Vasquez. And a few months ago, she reached out to me by email and I love it when practitioners do this because she was just saying she was familiar with my work, she loves what I do and she just wanted to like pop on a call and just get to know each other. And because of what she does, her world is pelvic health physiotherapy. So doing what I do, I work a lot with conditions like endometriosis, pelvic pain, from more of an internal nutritional hormone type perspective, but I'm constantly referring out to different practitioners, whether it's chiropractors, acupuncturists, energy healers, and it's always good to have a list of people who you trust and yeah, you can kind of work together to get the patient better. So today we're going to be talking all about the uh, structural issues that can happen and some of the things that a pelvic floor um physio can help you with if you aren't yet aware of it because I haven't touched on it too much in the episodes I have spoken about how, how I went to see a physio myself a few months ago and maybe we'll touch on that um, as we get through the episode but just starting off with Natalia's bio so she is a passionate and committed physiotherapist with experience and a great interest in pelvic health and neurological pelvic dysfunction after graduating with a first class degree in physiotherapy, Natalia gained a master's in clinical neuroscience at the University College London and immediately started her clinical research into neurogenic bladder and pelvic dysfunction. Following her research, Natalia had continued to take part in the academia and had presented her work in numerous national and international meetings. She focuses in re-education and manipulation of the abdominal and lumbar pelvic musculature for men and women suffering from a wide range of conditions, including bladder and chronic pelvic pain, idiopathic and neurogenic bladder dysfunction, urinary or fetal incontinence, and anal rectal and sexual dysfunction. Outside of work, she loves to practice yoga and meditation, which she also uses and practices with her patients. She enjoys cooking with her family and friends. And most of all, Natalia cherishes spending quality time with her daughter. So hello again, Natalia. It's nice to see you and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Yeah. And before we get into all of the questions, because I have so many for you, um, and I want this to be like a conversational style, just an introduction into what you can offer some of the ladies listening um, or kind of what your, um, your practice does. But why did you decide to train as a physio? To begin with, did you ever struggle with anything like this or was it, has it just always been an interest? I think it's always been an interest and I think the it was a really odd one. I didn't know what to study because I loved so many different things. I loved everything about health, um, everything about psychology. I loved art, so I had no idea what to do. <laughs> when I was younger and one day my dad um, came back and I was like at that sort of age before you go to uni and, and he just told me that he had been to physio because he had tennis elbow he used to play a lot of tennis and how nice it was and how interesting and I don't know that kind of like just caught my attention and it was that particular moment when I thought well think this will be it um, so I started doing my physio training and I did it in Colombia um, and there while I was training I realized that I had a huge passion for neurological conditions so um, especially people with spinal cord injury so that was kind of like my first love in terms of my career so I did a lot of work in spinal cord injury and neurophysiotherapy. And then I realized I, I wanted to just understand a little bit more about neuroscience um, and about uh, like pain science and, and all sorts of kind of like neurological um, functions and, and research as well in that area. So I came to London and I did a master's degree in neuroscience. And then that led me to some research um, in, in bladder and pelvic reflexes in people with a spinal cord injury. So then kind of like two things came together in terms of pelvic function, but also spinal cord injury. And I just became fascinated about pelvic function 
and bladder, bowel, sexual dysfunction and how complex it is, but also how, um, I mean, how fascinating and how important it is. People don't talk about it uh, very much in people with spinal cord injury, for example, is the first priority or the first thing that people or patients will like to recover. And it's not uh, walking like many people might think it's actually bladder, bowel, sexual function. And that is the case for many kind of pathologies and, or, or many at least neurological conditions because it, it, it takes away your independence, uh, I mean, dignity, all sorts of things. So I started um, doing some research in, in the pelvic, in the pelvic um, sort of rehab world. I started doing some training uh, with the pelvic obstetric and gynecological sort of physiotherapy um, group that is a very well-established, well-known group in the UK. And, and I became completely uh, passionate about it. So I sort of like started shifting my, my focus and then I started doing pelvic rehab. Um, so I did some research in that area. And after doing some research that actually showed a, a real benefit to pelvic physiotherapy in that particular population, I thought, okay, well, let's expand because this is just too good to just keep it small. Um, and although I continue to work with neurological uh, patients and, and that is a big, big part of my, my work, I, I started to develop like privately my practice on seeing patients just in the general population that suffer with chronic pelvic pain that might be due to um, bladder pain syndromes or interstitial cystitis or uh, prostatitis in men, for example. Endometriosis is a big one because um, women with endometriosis suffer with pain for so long before they reach to us. And I, I believe that's probably your case as well. Um, it takes a really long time before a, a, a woman with endometriosis kind of comes to us, sadly. But I, I started treating uh, a lot of, lots of women and men with different conditions and not just pelvic pain, but incontinence for different reasons. Um, I kind of, I'm carrying on, <laughs> but I don't want to just go on and on and on. Um, if I'm deviating from from what you want me to to, to talk, so please stop me. No, at it's any like point a huge subject. I could definitely me... <laughs> tell you're you're passionate about it. But what I wanted to know is if spinal cord injuries and the neurological system is like a huge driver of some of these conditions. I think when people hear spinal cord injury, the first thing they think of is like car accident, like major hospitalizations mm -hmm. and things like that. But is there anything less maybe serious um, that can affect things like our brain and our nervous system and cause issues to our spine. Absolutely. I mean, something as, as simple, I say, but something as common maybe is, the, is a better term as low back pain and a progressive low back pain or chronic low back pain that then develops into uh, lumbar bulge discs. And that can develop into uh, something called cord equina syndrome, where the when where the the nerves at the bottom of your spine become compressed or, or disrupted, and that results in pelvic dysfunction. So it can result in urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, um, saddle area numbness. Um, it can result in, I mean, it can, the pain can persist. So someone that might have had cord equina sort of compression or compromise might still have low back pain and uh, leg pain because of the compression of the nerves that go down to your leg, down your legs and to your feet. So maybe I wouldn't say it's less, 
severe because obviously it's very relative and for 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 particular patients it can be completely and utterly debilitating and we might see people with called equinus syndrome walking around but they are incontinent on their or they really really struggle with um, their bowels for example I'm guessing there's obviously things like sports injuries that will probably Absolutely. be a huge factor but what about just simple posture issues people with bad posture or working at desks do you think see that playing yes. a role Absolutely, absolutely. So people that um, I see some people that come to me with the manifestation of pelvic floor dysfunction. So they might come to me saying that they have um, an overactive bladder, but they have had tests and they don't have any urine infection, or they have, um, they have been told they might have a, like interstitial cystitis, which kind of gives you sort of like a bladder type of pain, but really nothing else is going on. And when I sort of dig through the history of the patient and when I dig really, really deep into what's happened in the past, I might find that um, this person like spends a huge amount of time sitting. Or I might find that this person does a huge amount of, let's say, um, Pilates. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that Pilates is bad. I'm not saying that that is the cause of the problem in every case. But if, um, if you think of someone that engages the core or that works on their core a lot, or that simply is super stressed and so their core is really, really stiff because they don't breathe properly and it happens to all of us whenever we're stressed or whenever we're in pain, we don't breathe and we kind of like engage and, and guard all the abdominal muscles which are part of the pelvic floor. Then that on its own can have a huge effect on how your bladder is working and how your bowel is working and how um, your sexual function is. So I think it's, there are a million reasons for the pelvic floor um, to, to manifest itself, but, and it could be pain, but it could be incontinence, urinary or fecal. It could be um, sexual dysfunction. It could be painful sex. It could be erectile dysfunction. It could be something called persistent genital arousal um, dysfunction, where there's nothing sort of sort of erogenous about it, but it's just like a persistent tension or um, not relaxing um, muscles around the clitoris, for example, that is incredibly debilitating because it's not pleasurable. It's it's completely the opposite. So lots of things can drive a dysfunctional pelvic floor uh, yeah and i'm it's, constantly recommending things like pilates mm -hmm. to clients because it is a lower stress workout than maybe the yes. usual crossfit or marathon training and things like that but there's a tipping point isn't there with pretty much all Absolutely. exercise like more isn't necessarily better and just because you're not yes. like maybe running or pouring in sweat afterwards if you're constantly tense and exercise is a stress at the end of the day so you have to bear yes. that in mind like anything when you overdo it um, and maybe the real more relaxing versions instead of tightening everything up is the way to go so in terms Absolutely. of exercise is there any exercise that's like generally good for everyone in your opinion no i think it, it exercise is very very individual i had just seen today a um, endometriosis patient and her kind of like level of stiffness or of, of muscle stiffness overall in her whole body is really really high and so we're trying to work on that so she doesn't kind of like keeps herself really really stiff all the time and so her pelvic floor doesn't kind of like come up all the time but it's kind of like more relaxed and it only comes up when it needs to come up and I think that is a huge part of our work and, um, and she was asking me this precise question, like, I really feel that I need to exercise. 
can I maybe or shall I start running or shall I start um, doing some Pilates? And my recommendation is, or, or my, my recommendation in that specific type of patient, not for everyone, but for that specific type of patient is do something that is low impact and that releases and reduces the amount of stiffness that is there in your body, especially in the core. So if I ask someone that suffers with pelvic pain, like she does, or someone like with endometriosis that has a little bit of a, a problem with um, managing the intra-abdominal pressure because of the amount of pressure, amount of pain that is there, I would say anything that is kind of like expanding and releasing and softening will be a better, a better bet. But that doesn't mean that in the future I might not, I, I wouldn't recommend Pilates or, or heat exercises and heat training or spinning or things like that. I think there is a, a time and a moment for different types of exercise. Yeah, you definitely shift so, and change so don't get too stuck on this is good that's bad like your body's going to change along with your hormones and everything absolutely exactly but I wouldn't say either stop any exercise because then you have to really put in a balance all the benefits that exercise gives you and if somebody loves cycling and that's kind of like their stress relief I'm not going to say you have to stop cycling um I might modify it and I might kind of reduce the intensity of the resistance or include something else that might kind of compensate for that um, stress releaser. But uh, exercise is, is, is very important. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever kind of say you stop, I mean, stop that. I might just modify it and find something that fits more into the condition at the time for that particular patient. And when I was younger, I didn't really know the difference between a personal trainer and a physiotherapist. So could you just like, is one better than the other? Or um, do some personal trainers know about the pelvic floor? Or if they have a symptom like you've listed, is it best to fix that problem before going into a personal trainer? I would say that's probably right. I would say if you have a problem, I think it's better to, if you have like a problem that seemed to be kind of like pelvic floor related or like core related, even if it's low back pain, because the core, I maybe I just go back a little bit and I um, talk about how the pelvic floor and the core and your diaphragm and your back kind of interconnect. So if you have low back pain, um, it can be that your pelvic floor or it could be that your pelvic floor is, is reacting to it. And it might be reacting in a way that is going to have a, a negative effect on your pain or on your bladder, on your bowels, because they are guarding in response to the back pain. So I would say if if there is anything going on in the abdominal area or in the lower back, in the sacrum, in, in the hips, in anywhere like that, I think it's better to have a check with a pelvic physio, um, with, I mean, by all means, with your GP, um, might be able to spot it, not always, but it might be, it might be a good idea to just first check how everything in that area is working and then maybe go to a personal trainer and say, look, I, I, I want to um, have a little bit more stability in my lower back or I want to strengthen my core or, I mean, it's just very, very tricky to, to really think of one one particular scenario but I think when it comes to the pelvic floor when it comes to having bladder or bowel or sexual dysfunction it's very very important to have to have it checked by a by a pelvic health physio and then get the the go ahead of now it's okay for you to go and and do some some exercise uh, or some heat training it's it's really we need to think of the pelvic floor as the kind of like the bottom of our pelvis and it needs to manage everything that goes on above that area. 
So if you are doing heat exercises, for example, um, and you're leaking, there is obviously the amount of pressure that you're putting yourself through and you're putting your pelvic floor through is too much for that pelvic floor to support. So we need to work on the pelvic floor to make sure that you can support that amount of, of intra-abdominal pressure that you, that you want uh, when you're doing certain exercise. But um, I mean, yeah. yes, tell me. <laughs> I was going to say from personal experience, um, personal trainers don't really have any knowledge on hormones or you tell them like, I'm on my period. Can I take it slower? They're like, no, it doesn't matter. Because a lot of them are just like exercise yeah. is everything. It doesn't really matter what you're eating. Just make sure you're hitting your calorie goals. I'm, t- I'm stereotyping here. Mm. I'm not. Your macro yes. counting, it doesn't matter where you're getting the food from or the quality. It's all about how many grams of protein and things so yeah I'd always say like fix any imbalances first and then if you want to work on a fitness goal or switch things up a little bit then get a personal trainer because they're more familiar with uh, posture when doing exercises yes not injuring yourselves and some of them might be familiar with some of this stuff but health is always before body goals or aesthetics or anything like that I think so I mean that is true and not not everyone will fit into that category but I would say I will agree with you with fixing the imbalances that might be there whether physical emotional hormonal any type of imbalance that they might be there and then really work on right I want to make myself fit and want to make my I want to look great in a bikini or whatever but that comes first I do think health and and balance equilibrium in in all of your of of the systems comes comes first yeah so imagine if you've got a prolapse or something and you're doing like a heavy squat that's not going to be a good combination it's not going to be a good combination absolutely not or if you or if you think or if you were told um by whoever that leaking because you're a woman and you had children is okay and then so you go and do (laughs) And, and start running and start doing all sorts of things, wearing a pad and make it normal. That's, that's not good. It's, mm-hmm. it's common, very, very common, but it's not normal. And nobody should really put up with anything like that. At the same time, like with sex or, or painful sex, it shouldn't be painful. And if it is, then you need to have a think and have... Um, an examination go and speak to someone a pelvic physio might really will really really help because we understand what goes on in that area and what was goes on in those muscles that should be relaxed and flexible but at the same time should be strong <laughs> Does that what make is sense? it that you're examining like during a consultation for example if someone's dealing okay. with any of those things that you've mentioned what can they expect i think the whole examination thing is what puts people off um maybe bad enough for them going for a smear test at the doctor's yes. but yeah for someone to be looking in and around the pelvic floor um, but i think getting an idea as to what to expect first might relax them a little bit uh, absolutely absolutely um right so we do look at uh, your spinal alignment i i look at the alignment it's very important to to see what's going on outside, what your posture is like and what your pelvic sort of joints are doing. Your lumbar spine, your sacral joint, your your hips, that is very important. Something else that we look at is your breathing pattern. And that is very, very important because there is a huge amount of research now um, that has shown how your diaphragm and how your pelvic floor are synchronized or work in synchrony. So when you breathe, your diaphragm goes down, your abdominal sort of organs need to go somewhere. So your tummy kind of like goes out and your pelvic floor needs to go somewhere. So when we assess um, breathing, what we want to look is if you are breathing really shallowly, which most of us do because we're stressed or we don't think about breathing enough. Um, but assessing the breath gives us an idea already of what might be happening in the pelvic floor. 
and addressing the breathing pattern and addressing your diaphragm is very, very important when it comes to pelvic health and pelvic rehab. So I will look at uh, the breathing and I will look at the abdominal, abdominal wall. I will look at all the tissues on the abdominal wall and the fascia because that connects to the pelvic floor. So I explain it um, to my patients like your abdominal uh, wall, it's kind of like it goes down and it continues into your pelvic floor. And then it continues back to your bottom or in your glutes. And then that continues up to your lower back. So it's not one thing and the other or the other. It's kind of like one whole canister. So assessing the whole canister from your diaphragm to your tummy, to your pelvic floor, from the outside and to your glutes and lower back, it's very, very important. So looking at that hole and how that is moving and how that is working and how does it feel, it's, it's part of the assessment. Then going down from there to the pelvic floor, I would observe the pelvic floor from the, from the outside to see the quality of the skin, if there are any scars, obviously in women, this becomes very important because of childbirth. So we want to know that if there are any scars, these are mobile and not stiff and tender or painful, because that would then mean that um, sex might be painful because there is a lot of stiffness, stiffness around the scar tissue. Or if you've had abdominal surgeries or a C-section, then that would have created scarring in areas that you can't really see. But when you palpate those areas, then you can tell if maybe those additions are, are contributing to any of your pelvic symptoms. Um, so observation is very important. Observation, um, when, when I ask the patient to cough, for example, is very important because I want to see if the urethra does what it needs to do. So I want to see if there is any leakage on coughing. I want to see if the pelvic floor sort of reacts and closes up when you cough, um, which is more like a reflex, um, but you can learn that action as well. I want to see if there is any gaping in the meatus, um, in the vagina, in the anus. I kind of want to observe and that area needs to look healthy on the outside and it's to in order to work properly as well then internally so with women obviously we do an internal examination using one finger generally speaking with the patient in in lying position there are um sort of circumstances and depending on on what the patient symptoms are we might do an examination with the patient in standing especially if that patient sort of complains of symptoms when they're standing or when they're running or when or, or when they are um, squatting doing lots of uh, crossfit exercises for example but generally speaking we do an examination through the vagina just to feel the tissues in the vagina. And so what we want to feel is how stiff those tissues are, or how stiff those muscles are. So from just kind of rewinding a little bit of from the, from the outside, we can also feel pelvic floor muscles that are superficial. And those superficial pelvic floor muscles that are kind of outside the vagina or like around the vagina and at the base of the penis and around your anal sphincter can be painful, uh, can be stiff, can be completely normal, can feel completely normal. So we do want to palpate on the outside as well. And then we want to palpate because we want to assess the neurology of that area. So we want to see if the sensation in that area is normal or is enhanced. So we want to know if uh, for example, on, on someone with, with pain around the vulva, or someone with vulvodynia, or someone with um, 
pain just in any area in the pelvis is suffering with some sort of like nerve compression. So we want to kind of assess and compare on both sides the sensation if everything feels normal or if it feels numb or if it feels painful because some for some people even a, a light touch might feel very very painful or something like um, uh, a little bit of like pressure with your finger might feel just like a, uh, an enhanced sort of like response which then can already tell you what is going on deeper in the pelvic floor so then moving back into the deep pelvic floor muscle assessment through the vagina we want to feel the inside of the vagina um, feel if there is kind of like enough sort of um, glide enough lubrication we want to feel if there is stiffness we want to feel what happens when we ask the patient to cough we want to feel what happens when we ask the patient um, to bear down um, and we want to feel what happens when we ask the patient to do a pelvic floor squeeze or a pelvic floor exercise. So the technique of doing pelvic floor exercises is very important um, because we want those muscles to work on their own as much as possible. Um, many people might, um, because they heard that it was a really good idea or because they've been told that they should do lots of pelvic floor exercises or kegels as they've been called um, for many years that they should do them but they and they might have been doing them thinking that they were doing the right thing but really they haven't so we assess the technique that they the patient might have if they're already doing those exercises but what we might find is that those muscles are either normal or they are weak so they can't really sort of uh, engage they 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 are too weak to maybe for example close the urethra enough when the patient coughs and that's why the patient leaks um, so in that case we will need to retrain those muscles so then they become stronger but we might feel if those muscles are too stiff that we need to release the tone or re reduce the tone in those muscles so then um, they can work properly. An analogy that I use very, very often with patients is if you imagine the, the pelvic floor muscles as your sort of neck and shoulder muscles, um, your shoulder, if your shoulders kind of like start going up through the day, through the day because you might have a headache or you are really stressed, those muscles around your neck and around your shoulders are going to become really, really stiff. Um, and that doesn't mean that they are strong. They are, they, it means that they're just stiff and they're not working properly. So someone that works their pelvic floor muscles out too much, for example, or that they've been doing lots of pelvic floor exercises or they keep their core engaged all the time might have very very stiff pelvic floor muscles so that can then result in all sorts of things starting from pain during sex for example or bladder overactivity because if you keep those muscles like that it's almost like they are talking to your bladder telling your bladder you need to go you need to go but really is those muscles that are kind of sending that um, that message to your bladder and to your brain where there might be nothing wrong with your bladder. So assessing the, the tone in those muscles, the stiffness and any pain that might be there is very, very important. Um, what else? In, it, that is basically an internal examination. We kind of go through both sides. We compare both sides. They should be symmetrical. They should react when you cough. They should react when you laugh. They should react when you bear down. Um, and they should react when you ask them to kind of like close and lift, but also when you say now release or drop and open, because we need both actions equally um, 
to be able to go for a weep, to be able to open our bowels, to be able to uh, hold uh, our, our urge if we can't go to the toilet or to hold uh, some wind if we're in a room full of people and we need to break wind, but we can't. We need to those muscles to be able to react to what we need. Um, so that examination is very important. Some, some people kind of come to us or come to me feeling very apprehensive, understandably, because they might have had so much going on, so many examinations where they had no um, light or no sort of answer to their problem. Um, but I think physios and I am, again, generalizing massively here, but I think we have a very, a very different approach to examination and to, um, and to treatment. I don't know, I kind of feel that we might have, at least in the private sector, a little bit more time to really listen to the patient and to really um, to really understand the connection between your muscles, your nerves, your brain, and 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 your bladder and your bowels. So it might be sometimes it happens if you go to um, a doctor that might be looking at your bowel and might find nothing wrong with your bowel, but they're not really looking at your pelvic floor. Or they're not really looking at your core. Um, so they're. I think that is that is important, um, and and we have to, or I, sort of keep it in my mind all the time with every single patient I see that I want to make. I want to make that patient feel completely safe, so then everything can be kind of like out there, and we can really explore what's going on and what what um, might have brought the problem which on its own gives you a huge amount of kind of information and tools to then re resolve the problem. Um, and it's not, it shouldn't be painful. So a pelvic floor examination shouldn't be painful. Sometimes if the problem is pelvic pain, it might be because uh, those tissues are very restricted. Um, and sometimes having to release those tissues and those muscles might be a little bit uncomfortable but i think it's almost as when you if you, if you have a very very tight or very uh, stiff neck and you want to kind of like stretch that neck that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit painful at the beginning and so i think i do explain it like that to some patients because um, it can be uncomfortable but I think it's important to do um, so I don't I hope that that doesn't put anyone off um, coming in for an examination definitely not no you think you've put everyone's mind at ease and I'll from my personal experience uh, I didn't come and see you I went to see Deb at Bump to Beyond mm -hmm. in what was that? can't remember be in the show notes um, <laughs> but I think yeah a big part of your job is to put someone at ease and relax them as they come in um, it was in sale in Manchester just pops okay. in my head <laughs> um but yeah if you're going in the tents and stress and it's just yeah another appointment where they're prodding and poking you and no one's believing you it's all in your head then you are going to be tense and then the examination is not going to go well and maybe not going to find out what's wrong um, and there is part of that like stretching the muscle it might hurt a little bit it's kind of similar to the healing reaction the healing journey on my side of things sometimes things get a little bit worse as you're detoxing and healing but it's not to say that you're not on the right track and um, sometimes you have to push through a little bit it shouldn't be debilitating yes. or crippling pain but yeah um the the way that you do the examinations sounds very thorough um but i have a few questions from what you said the first one was you mentioned going private or through the nhs yes. um could you give like some pros and cons to either for those in the uk um i mean the nhs is like <laughs> don't be afraid i've said a few things on here <laughs> before so yeah. um yeah most people is... don't have a great experience if i'm honest with these types of chronic situations like acute illness yes. and car accidents and surgeries absolutely amazing but with these chronic conditions people 
often don't find the, uh, the answers that they should. Yes, I mean, I think it's the NHS resources are really, really limited, unfortunately, and I don't think it's kind of um, down to the physios, uh, the specialist physios that work in the NHS, and I, I include myself in that, that group because the NHS is still, um, I still work for the NHS, but the resources are really limited. I think I am maybe in a lucky position because I see a very, very specific group of patients that are incredibly complex. Um, so I can put time into seeing them. But I know the bigger kind of centers for like, um, like, like the Eurogyne centers, uh, postnatal um, sort of physiotherapy clinics, are like really, really overstretched. And I'm not sure how much effort can uh, a women's health physio put into, into their practice and into their time with the patient um, to really make a big difference. I do, hear, I do hear all sorts of stories, like positive and negative. So I do see patients that have been to the NHS um, for pelvic pain but very, very, very few. I think women like, for example, with endometriosis, um, PCOS, uh, bladder pain symptoms, uh, syndromes, are really, they really don't get offered much in terms of pelvic physiotherapy. I think those patients, generally speaking, um, do their own research and find their own way. They might have found, they might find um, uh, a pain consultant that might kind of like understand and, and, and promote pelvic physiotherapy because they have seen firsthand their, the benefit of it. But I think those are really lucky patients, sadly. Um, in terms of the private practice, I mean, I think most of us in the, in the health sort of world have learned after being in the NHS only that you can't really unfortunately offer everything that you want to offer to those patients just in the NHS. You try and I do, do try, but it's very, very difficult because there are no resources. Um, I think there is a little bit more awareness, not a little bit more awareness. I, I, think, I think that there is a lot more awareness on, on the benefits of pelvic health physiotherapy, but I think we're still kind of a long way to go. You'd say if someone has the uh, resources and the means to and the, the money to spend on going private, like it's worth it. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, and we can just, the thing is, <laughs> I like to see a patient as a whole and I don't kind of I don't I don't like to focus on the pelvic floor but it's just everything else that's going on and we've sort of briefly discussed this in the past and how important um, like an equilibrium of the systems is for anyone with any issues um, especially dealing with pain but there's no amount of pelvic physiotherapy that I can do that will fix a patient with pelvic pain if there is no kind of awareness or um, input from the nutritional point of view, from the mental health point of view, because these patients very, very often are incredibly anxious and stressed and depressed and uh, frustrated because of the amount of um, time that they might have had to suffer with pain. So it's kind of working in the private world is positive, but in a way I do see that these connections are really, really important because you really want to have people that you can um, send your patients to. There's sometimes people in the private work might kind of want to keep their patients to themselves and want to kind of um, kind of build up on their on their um, on their clinic list but 
fail to to really tap onto the on the resources of other people that can also offer massive amounts of help to to each particular patient so i think we have to make a bit a better effort and a bigger effort compared to the nhs because in the nhs you work with a multidisciplinary team and that is wonderful but when you're private um that is not there so you really need to actively um, look out for colleagues that understand pain that understand um, health that understand nutrition and hormonal balance and all these things that are incredibly important couldn't agree more yeah we we need to kind of for, specialize in our areas but also be open to other Absolutely. people helping as well and i don't with my clients claim to fully fix them all on my own i'm constantly referring out to other people um and like yourself i always say with endometriosis i can do all the hormone side of things reducing inflammation making sure that the diet and the detoxification is good but yes. if they are like chronically tense or they have some structural issues they're not going to see the results um and i won't take the full episode up going through my approach with some of these conditions but I've, I've showed them multiple times before um the most recent one is an episode of the podcast 135 which only yes. two is a solo on vaginal health i cover other things as well like yeast infections bacterial mm-hmm. vaginosis but also chronic pelvic pain um, bladder issues as well with some of the root causes there yes um yes. but do you have a resource or a website that people could find a good practitioner privately like yourself in the uk um, there is um, the physio to you that is part of the Chartered Physiotherapy Society kind of um, website. And if you go there and you type your postcode uh, and you type um, basically what type of um, physiotherapy that you need. So, for example, women's health physiotherapy or men's health physiotherapy, then you should see a, a list of private practitioners in your area uh, but you can also look at squeezy which is an app that i are and we recommend very often um, especially for people with stress urinary incontinence um, but there is a squeezy directory so you can find private practitioners there as well um, both men and women's health uh, physiotherapists Great. And a few years ago now, I interviewed the only other real episode that I've done on pelvic health is with Jessica Drummond, who is an American practitioner. Uh, Really great episode. So I'll link to that as well, because it shows some different things that we've not covered today. But she has a lot of resources for those in the US. So if you're listening now and you really want to go and see a a women's health um, physio, then that episode will show some of the resources in the show notes. Um, So that's episode number 42. And mm-hmm. a root, common root cause that I touched on multiple times during that solo episode I did on vaginal health was the effect of uh, mental and emotional stress, which you've spoken about today, but also traumatic events, particularly like sexual related assaults and rape. How often do you have to bring that up with clients? So sexual health and, and sexual function is like a daily, it's up there in my list of questions for patients and some patients might come to me with that as their pride like as as their main problem but most of them won't come up with a sexual dysfunction or a sexual um, health problem to start with but once you kind of dig into it you kind of start finding actually that oh there are some problems there there is some painful sex going on or they've had, or there has been some maybe events from relationships that might have created some trauma around sex and that might have created some guarding in the pelvic floor because of that particular event. So it is something that I bring up every single time and I try to kind of, as I carry on with the treatment and with the sessions, I continue to ask about it um, because it's so, it's absolutely important. It's, um, I mean, who wants to 
have painful sex or not enjoy sex as 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 we should um i'm sorry i think i lost no the, and again it might not be because yeah when people think of sexual issues or trauma they think of like mm-hmm. i've never been raped i've never had like any oh, bad yes. sexual experience but i mean if you're constantly having vaginal dryness that becomes traumatic Abs- after um after time after time absolutely or, yeah just one negative experience someone comments on something um yes. about your body then that could be something um to bring up as well it's all important information absolutely yes yes so it doesn't need to be something really dramatic although it does happen of course but um one event can trigger a huge cascade of of uh manifestations that then kind of stay in a vicious circle of maybe pain tension lack of function lack of oxygen restriction then more pain yeah, and like fear. muscle memory isn't it even it if you feel memory. like you've processed the trauma that you went through and you you change your beliefs like physically your body remembers absolutely your body remembers and if and it goes the other way around so they might feel well i actually yeah no that's fine so if i examine someone um and and they might not be pain in that area but then that person might tell me that they had uh, a very traumatic sexual experience then that is going to be something that needs to be addressed um, clearly. So it can go both ways. But anything like vaginal dryness or, um, I mean, again, endometriosis can be a, a cause for, for painful sex and for just general pelvic pain. Um, in in perimenopausal women and in in menopausal women, vaginal dryness is a big thing, and and I kind of always ask about it because I don't want women ever to think that when they reach menopause, that's it, and kind of like the libido goes down, the dryness goes up, and so forget about sex. I kind of want to maybe empower those women to find the way to make those things better and there are ways to do that there are vaginal um, moisturizers that are perfectly safe and organic that can be used regularly and can make a massive massive difference obviously with i do see patients with endometriosis that have had hysterectomy because of endometriosis and then the, the amount of symptoms that come with hysterectomy on its own are huge in, in terms of urogynecological symptoms. So we need to address those for sure. And are there any over-the-counter brands for these like vaginal creams or moisturizers? Because it's not just people, people think vaginal dryness are not menopausal. I'm in my 20s and 30s, but even with clients, Absolutely. it's such a common yes. problem with things like low testosterone or as simple as dehydration your tissues yes. down there are going to be dehydrated as well absolutely so uh, there is one that i recommend all the time and i think is a favorite within the pelvic health physiotherapy world and is yes mm-hmm. y-e-s and they have um, different products but people sometimes get it uh, or get confused and use a vaginal lubricant as a vaginal moisturizer which are completely different so a vaginal moisturizer is something to use regularly um, inside the vagina to keep those tissues moist and healthy a vaginal lubricant or a, a, a lubricant is more like moment like for the moment and for intercourse specifically it kind of like disappears very quickly um, and is for the purpose of 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 sex pretty much but um, a moisturizer is something that you put into the vagina as you put onto your skin to keep yourself hydrated. And so yes, is the one I recommend. Perfect. I will link to that as well. Um, and that is the one that the physio that I went to recommends as well. So I know that that's oh, like good. very clean. I've double checked the ingredients with her and I, yes. I promote it as well. <laughs> <laughs> good. And um, last couple of questions now before we finish up. 
Um, when I went to the pelvic health physio, it was because I had an issue with a menstrual cup, which I'd used for years and years now. Absolutely loved them, raved about them to clients, but then I started having an issue with the removal for no mm-hmm. real reason at all. It just didn't suit my body anymore. So um, that's why I went to see. So it doesn't need to be um, that you just go and see someone when there's like a major issue. If there's just like a, a niggling symptom or the first signs of something happening, that's the sweet, like that's the perfect time to go and see someone and nip it in the bud. But she, my, my physio then was saying, menstrual cups are a bit up in the air. We don't really know the long-term effects. Yes, they're good for being kind of eco-friendly and easier mm-hmm but she was worried potentially about the long-term effects of that sucking sensation, that suction um, on the Mm -hmm. pelvic floor. So I don't know if you've got any experience with those and yoni eggs, which are another kind of holistic, um, kind of a bit woo-woo, but I think there's definitely some science behind the use of crystals and stones. But yeah, anything that you're placing in that area, um, what do you think with those two in particular? So with the menstrual cup, I mean, I am... I'm a fan of them. I, I use it myself, but I do kind of think as well, what is the long-term effect? I kind of feel confident with using it because I do pelvic floor exercises. <laughs> so I kind of, I feel that I am protecting against any sort of weakness, weakness that I might be um, creating with the regular kind of like pulling and sucking from the vaginal cup, the menstrual cup. Um, I think there is, uh, there are people, there are women that are kind of, that, that are suitable for, and definitely women that aren't, um, that I wouldn't recommend it to. Someone with um, something called EDS, Ellis Danlos syndrome, or like any kind of collagen um, dysfunction or hyperlaxitude, I think I wouldn't. Not because it doesn't, I mean, in, on one side it gives support because it works almost like a pessary. So it kind of gives support to the vaginal wall. Um, for the, the time that you have it in but then the the sucking up and to to pull it down might be a little bit of like damaging oh, I don't want to say damaging because there is we don't know but it might be just lengthening those tissues more than they should be does that make sense so yeah that's interesting because I, I don't have full-blown EDS or I don't think I do mm-hmm. but I definitely have um, an issue with there's like a trio with muscle activation, POTS, and this joint hypermobility. Oh, I definitely okay. fall into that. So maybe because, um, yeah, I was prone to injuries in my knees and I'm very flexible. Mm-hmm. So maybe that was part of um, the thing for me. It is possible. Very, very possible. Because what happens and when I see EDS patients or hyper like lax patients, um, they, have, they can have a very, very tight pelvic floor because they're kind of like always um, or they might they might be always kind of like engaging the pelvic floor because there is a little bit of uh, lack of support from from being very very lax if you have like hyperlaxitude in your lower spine then you would kind of like naturally engage those those muscles and they don't really get a chance to relax if you if you are engaging them so someone with um hyper laxitude creates a lot of tension in the belly of the muscle so the ends of the muscle kind of like goes out and that's why you can be amazing at yoga and doing all sorts of things um, but then the 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 middle part of the muscle does really never kind of like stretch so then it accumulates a lot of tension so the middle of the muscle or the belly of the muscle becomes very stiff, whereas the ends of the muscle, the tendons get very, very lax. So it's common to be very lax, but very, very kind of stiff. So with patients like you, what we would want to work on is in making sure those muscles are released properly, but they're 
kind of working at the same time. If they're like that, if they're really, really tight, they, they're not really working very well. They need to kind of be able to, or they need to be released. So then you can work on them and they can become, or they can give you or provide you with the stability that you need in that area. And what are some of the tools um, or exercises you use to both like tighten if it's lax or relax if someone's like super tight? Is that just like exercises or? Yes. Yeah, so if, it's, if someone is kind of suffering with a lot of pelvic floor tension or high or high tone pelvic floor, or sometimes we call it non-relaxing pelvic floor. So it's kind of like really, really tight all the time. I would start with breath. I will start with the breathing because, um, again, when you learn how to breathe properly and you learn how to use your diaphragm, so your diaphragm kind of like uh, does the whole sort of movement. And when you take a deep breath, the diaphragm goes down. You are also allowing the pelvic floor to go down. So the breath on its own is a major um, part of releasing tension in the pelvic floor. So I could say to someone with increased tension in the pelvic floor to work on deep, deep breathing, trying to kind of like lower down the, or um, to bring the breath all the way down to the pelvis without pushing, but just kind of allowing the expansion to happen and hold that breath for say eight seconds. And then release that. So I, I, what I want to do is allow the breath to stretch from the inside, if that makes sense, those pelvic floor muscles, and then kind of they come back to their position. And then you repeat that breath and that's going to allow those muscles to ah, have a little break. So instead of being up here, then they're kind of like down here where they should be. They only need to go up when we need them to, to go up. Um, and I would then work on kind of reversed kegels. Some people call them like that. I don't call them like that, but I think people, most people kind of like understand that term, um, which is basically down train the pelvic floor. So instead of asking the, per the person to do uh, lots of pelvic floor exercises where they close the back passage and lift, I might want to work on closing the back passage, but then releasing it and really focusing the attention on the opening up. And then maybe allowing that to happen before you close again and then release again. So I would work on that before we work on the, right, now let's make those muscles stronger. Mm -hmm. Because if we work on making muscles stronger that are already, that. I'll say that again, if I work on muscles that are tight to make them stronger, it's just, they're just going to become tighter. They're going to become really painful. You might get some bladder um, symptoms, some bowel symptoms, some painful sex, some, all, all sorts of things. So I think working on the release is very, very important before you work on the strengthening or um, on the toning, let's say. Amazing, That's so important. Um, and then your other question about the um, eggs. Mm -hmm. So these are weights, weight, mm. weight eggs. Yeah, so they use them for yeah. weights. Um, so yeah, any incontinence and things like that. But people also use them for um, like energy, spiritual things as well, like fertility. They like draw um, blood and kind of energy to the area of the pelvic floor, the sacral chakra, all of that. So yeah, okay. mainly for the weight thing. Um, but also like spiritual lies. Okay. Well, all, I am all about spiritual stuff <laughs> and uh, about chakras. And I, I am a, a firm believer in, in yoga and meditation and spiritual kind of balance and how that plays a part in your physical um, health. I don't have any experience with the eggs. Um, I think they might have a place for people that suffer, that have like pelvic floor weakness mainly. Um, but that's it. I think I would say hmm, if somebody has pelvic floor weakness and they put up an egg that has a weight in them, that might 
that might be a bit much for the pelvic floor. So I think if you have, if you don't have any issues in that area, it might be okay. I'm not too sure, mm-hmm. Vivian. I'm kind of like, I really need to think about it. But um, yeah, they've probably been someone... around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, people have been doing things like this, but they've become quite trendy again. And I always Absolutely. get questions on them. Yes, I think um, I do recommend some gadgets, let's say. I haven't really recommended um, eggs, but I think for someone with pelvic floor weakness and someone who has, for example, stress urinary incontinence or someone um, or a postnatal lady that had um, a baby and their, her pelvic floor is very weak and she wants to get her pelvic floor back uh, into shape, then I might recommend to start with pelvic floor exercises, obviously under um, the direct, uh, under kind of like supervision. That is very important. Getting the technique right, then if we don't get those muscles kind of like going because the recoil is not happening because there might have been a little bit of nerve kind of uh, damage. So then the that person's mind or brain can't really connect with the pelvic floor and that does happen then at that at those um in those cases i might recommend something like electrical stimulation or biofeedback which is essentially putting up um into the vagina an electrode that is connected to a handheld device and that can either um deliver some electrical stimulation to wake up to to kind of wake up those muscles um to help with the strengthening or it can simply tell you how you're doing your not how you're doing your pelvic floor exercise but it gives you the feedback of when you do the pelvic floor exercise and when you're kind of not, because if you have lost connection with your pelvic floor, you might kind of need the feedback. When I am examining you, I can tell you, right, you're doing the right thing. And here is where you need to contract. Here's where I want to feel kind of the lift. But when when someone is at home, they might want to use something that gives them a little bit of feedback. So those eggs in a way might work a little bit like feedback, because if you feel them there it might make you kind of so bring engage the to the those. area yes but i would always be cautious mm. with things that yeah they're not going to fix like a like major that. complex issue so they might be a little helping tool that you do every now and again but i mean if you've got like again prolapse or really tight pelvic floor and you think that it's loose then you're just going to potentially make it worse yeah but over, double check with a pelvic health issue <laughs> absolutely and Final few questions are for you. So first one is what's something that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony? I meditate. That is kind of, I have been doing for a long, 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 long time. And I, I swear by it, I can't recommend it enough. And I, it's one of the first things I put my patients into, especially those pain patients. Um, so meditation is kind of, um a go-to and a daily daily routine i really need to get back into it (laughs) (laughs) i do fall out of it yeah (laughs) it do it's kind of like normal to fall out of fall out of it because i don't know because we get busy Mm -hmm. but then i instantly instantly feel the need like oh my gosh i feel rubbish i really need to do it i and the the benefits are just i mean you know the link the list is long absolutely next one is what's your go-to breakfast my go-to breakfast it's um it's something i make which is um oats so dry oats with a bit of water and some sea salt and I mean, this is like really, really basic, but I make these sort of like flat bread out of oats mm-hmm. <laughs> that I put in the microwave. And this is, I'm a busy single mom, so it's oh, no, perfect because perfect. it's very, very quick. So I put it in the microwave and it comes out as like a, a, a crisp kind of flat 
oat <laughs> uh, cake. And then, and then I put some peanut butter on top or almond butter and I have a decaf coffee. And that is my, that is kind of like my quick breakfast. It's not the, the healthiest. I'm better with lunch and dinner, but bread in a square of 85% dark chocolate. Oh, perfect. <laughs> You've got your healthy fats there. And I've not heard that one before, but could be a good like go to quick breakfast and making this elaborate kind of nourishable thing you get you're getting the macronutrients yes. um perfect in that in that uh, i'm trying <laughs> i try is there a supplement a product or a herb that you couldn't live without i discover quercetin mm. um i discovered quercetin i think um maybe just before the pandemic or maybe at the beginning uh, when I started kind of becoming interested in functional medicine and all these amazing um, just like nutrition and um, yeah, functional medicine mainly. And quercetin, I started taking back then because I wanted to make myself less allergic <laughs> to cats <laughs> because I wanted to get a cat for my daughter. Um, anyway, so... I found that since taking quercetin, I haven't had a cold, touch wood, and I, I swear by it as well. I think it's one of those supplements that at these, especially nowadays, is really, really important. And I don't think we get enough of it from the, from the foods that we, that we take. I mean, I try, I eat an apple every single day, um but i don't think that's enough well, yeah unfortunately not the soil's depleted the exactly. fruits and veg are just less nutrient dense than they used to be so supplements exactly. are often needed for an extra little boost i love yes. question too i use it a lot um on rotation for like histamine allergy problems myself and it's an antioxidant so it helps with inflammation and things and it's even been right. shown for the virus um, combined yes. with zinc to be very protective so Again, I've not had that one recently on, on the um, favorite supplements list. It's usually like magnesium and things, but quercetin is a favorite yes. of mine too. Oh, and good. Last question, Natalia, is where can people find more from you online? So website or social media. And if they're in and around the London area, if they want to book in for a consultation, where are, your, where are you based? So um, people can read a little bit about me in my website. It's um, nataliavasquez.co.uk and you can book um, a consultation with me through my website. I, am a, I, I wish I was, but I'm an, I am not a social media person. I think I'm kind of just a little bit old. I don't know. I think I- I wish I wasn't a social that. media person, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Life would be so I, much easier. Do you know what? I so many times I've tried. I'm like, right, I need to get into it, but I just can't. I can't, and um, and it's okay. I think it's okay. I think I'm yeah, you're, you're making it. big uh, changes <laughs> and helping people regardless. So yeah, just keep doing what yes. you're doing. Ah, uh, thank you. So no, I'm not in social media, but you can find me on my website, uh, or and you'll find my email there. I will respond to it um, and you can book with me through my website as well. Amazing. I will link to the, those things in the episode show notes. And Thank yeah, you. I thought this was amazing, very informative. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be um, thinking more about their pelvic health, which is the goal Good. of this episode. And also reminding them that if you're doing all of the food and the supplements and lifestyle stuff, but you're still struggling with any of these yes. conditions, then maybe seeking a different therapy, whether that is um, an energy practitioner for your trauma that you've been through or an acupuncturist to help with something else like your fertility and then a pelvic health yes. physio for any uh, specific symptoms related to that issue. So yeah, working in combination with people, getting a team around you um, and yeah, not just if you're a practitioner listening, not just focusing on your area of expertise passing the client on to other people and getting them the help that they need to absolutely i think well well said we need to work together <laughs> absolutely thanks natalia
Thank you, Vivian.